Hello, All Saints. This is Dustin Petty, part of the um, Reparations Working Group that the Vestries uh, assigned. Um, I wanted to go through a presentation today uh, to share with you all uh, to, to look at uh, the idea of reparations. Um, we're going to cover some of the local history of racial prejudices, uh, look at what reparations actually are, uh, see some examples of how they've been used in the past, and also the idea of uh, faith-based reparations. Uh, there shouldn't be a too long of a presentation, um, so buckle in. Uh, first, it's important to note that uh, by no means will uh, this be a complete history, uh, but it should give you an understanding of how racial prejudices and policies negatively affected Black citizens in our communities. We will focus on Lansing and East Lansing, but we, but we acknowledge that each community has its own unique past, and we encourage you to explore that. Um, and it's also important to note that racial prejudice has never been just a Southern problem. Racism was built into housing, education, and health systems, even here in Michigan. Uh, the photo you see there is from uh, during World War II. Um, we want white tenants in our white community. And it's from just out, it's from Detroit itself. Um, you might have heard about Earl Little. Uh, in 1929, he built or he bought a home in a whites only subdivision of Lansing. Uh, the home was burned to the ground. Uh, they were repeatedly encouraged to move out of the community, and by encouraged, I mean threatened violence. Um, but uh, before they could take any action, the home was burned to the ground. Uh, a few years later, he was beaten and placed on Lansing's streetcar tracks, uh, where he was run over and killed. Earl left uh, seven small children, including six-year-old Malcolm, who would later be widely known as widely known as Malcolm X. Um, redlining was a federal policy uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, where communities were split into zones based on which areas could get federal mortgage backing and which could not. Um, it was especially prevalent in uh, Lansing, where as opposed to um, larger cities where entire sections of the city were uh, blocked off um, or redlined, uh, where um, Blacks and other minority groups could live, um, in Lansing, it occurred at a micro level with blocks and streets being redlined um, instead of whole sections. Whereas here in East Lansing, I'm sure we've heard, a lot of you have heard and seen these um, restrictive covenants. Uh, it denied sale of homes to any non-whites. Uh, because of these, buyers did not have access to the mortgage market. Uh, their only choice was to buy home uh, via land contracts. This happened in both Lansing and East Lansing. Uh, during the 30 plus year payment process, they would earn no equity and have no rights to the homes. Um, and despite this practice being struck down by the Supreme Court in 1948 by Shelley versus Kramer, uh, it was still commonly used until the late 1960s. Uh, Dr. David W. Dixon, there on the right, became the first black homeowner in 1953. Um, Dr. Dixon was actually um, a member of All Saints Episcopal Church. He lived um, in the uh, collegiate housing. He and his wife, Vera, were um, chaperones of a sort there. Uh, and once they started having children, they wanted to move into their own home, but it was um, impossible for him to buy a home. So uh, president uh, of Michigan State, Michigan State College, uh, John Hanna had to buy a home for him. Um, Dr. Green on the left was the first black person to purchase a home uh, on his own accord in 68. Um, when he was uh, purchasing a home, Dr. Hanna from the university offered the same um, to Green that he'd offered to Dixon. Uh, but Green responded, I appreciate the offer, but are you, ever, are you going to buy every black man who comes to MSU a home? Um, people who came to East Lansing, uh, black, black uh, citizens, uh, folks who were um, coming to be uh, teachers, faculty members, graduate students, um, they would repeatedly hear, we don't rent to Negroes. Um, when Clarence Underwood arrived in East Lansing in 55, he's repeatedly told this, 
when he called to find a home for his new for his family. Uh, he began walking the streets of Lansing looking for places where blacks lived. Um, he thought to himself, I should just get back on the train and go home. Um, but after a few hours of walking those streets, uh, he finally found um, a room on Butler Street in uh, Lansing that he could rent. Now, East Lansing um, in 63, they uh, established the Human Rights Commission, Human, I'm sorry, Human Relations Committee to study open housing policies. Um, and there were several marches, uh, folks on campus, folks in our own church, East uh, All Saints, um, who wanted to see open housing practices. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they, the, the group was never able to um, accomplish that until 68 when Congress passed the Fair Housing Act finally. Um, here at All Saints, Mary Sharp, who I know most of us have heard of, um, she was an East Lansing City Council person from 65 to 77. And she was a trailblazer who passionately advocated for equality and civil rights for all people. At a time when East Lansing was not a community that prided itself on diversity, Mary championed open housing laws for all people. She passionately believed open housing laws were a civil right. Her early aggressive stance in open housing resulted in a ban against discriminatory practices that kept racial minorities from buying homes in East Lansing. She was also the first legal counsel on human rights to the president of Michigan State University and served as an active member of the Michigan Equality Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, the Greater Lansing Urban League, and a lot of other state um, and community organizations. Mary was really um, a champion. She got hundreds of people to sign an open housing uh, petition at All Saints um, that was presented to uh, the city council. Well, Lansing, between 1963 and 1967, urban or renewal projects destroyed Black communities. These are Black communities that had been redlined. Uh, they had been um, forced to live in, a, in small portions of the community. And these were also the uh, areas where the four, I-496 um, uh, destroyed when it was built um, in, in the 60s. Um, it literally destroyed these vibrant Black communities. Uh, in Lansing. What would happen is um, an appraiser would appear one day at your door telling you how much your home was earth, worth, how much they could get for it, um, and advising you not to fight City Hall because you couldn't win. Um, it was really meant to show that uh, the members of the Black community were powerless. Uh, there was no relocation assistance offered at the time. Um, folks who rented or were buying their house on contract, as I mentioned earlier, they received nothing. All in all, 890 homes were taken and uh, countless businesses, businesses, churches, and schools were wiped out. Um, one person who experienced this was Adolph Burton. He said, in that neighborhood was our local dentist, our doctor, who we purchased groceries from, my grandmother's house about three blocks away, and as well as the church we all went to. All of these institutions were destroyed by uh, the 496 construction. Um, another victim of the construction was the predominantly Black Lincoln School in Lansing. Uh, this photo is from the early 60s before the school was destroyed. Um, today, we find that 74% of redlined areas, formerly redlined areas, are still heavily, seg heavily segregated, and they're at a severe economic disadvantage, according to the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Through all these fights for equitable housing, it's important to note that Lansing and East Lansing churches were on the front lines, using the power of the pulpit and voices of their congregations to push officials to adopt open housing policies. Despite these actions, churches that are predominantly white have benefited from redlining and other race, racist policies. Our churches and their members have not had the same obstacles in buying homes, educating their children, their children dealing with financial institutions or seeking medical treatment as our black um, uh, fellow residents. It is for this reason, oops, sorry about that. It is for this reason that we look at reparations. <clears throat> the idea of reparations is to make amends for historical wrongs that have been done. Um, if you look at global examples, 
Um, some exist that uh, occurred after World War II and the Holocaust, when West Germany paid $7 billion to Israel and $1 billion, $1 billion to the World Jewish Congress. Um, South Africa, after uh, apartheid, um, recommended that uh, folks who had suffered from apartheid be paid an annual uh, fee for six years, or an annual payment for six years. Um, unfortunately, that was never carried out. Um, here in the United States in 71, uh, money and acres of land were given to, were returned to Alaskan natives. Um, and then a grant of 32 million to the Ottawa tribe of Michigan in 1986. And uh, as many of us will remember um, in the 80s, uh, folks who had been interred, Japanese Americans who had been interred during World War II were uh, finally issued an official apology. Um, and a small uh, cash um, gift. Um, some more recent examples. In 94, uh, Florida awarded 150000 to each living Black former resident of the Rosewood community, where uh, a white massacre of Black citizens occurred uh, 70 years earlier. Um, in 99, Pigford versus Glickman was a class, act, class action lawsuit in which 400 farmers had been discriminated against by the USDA. Um, awards were $50,000 for most who uh, filed claims, but there were several larger claims into the millions um, that are still have not been paid out. And then in 2005, compensation was offered by uh, private citizens, or I'm sorry, by private donations and some state funds to black citizens of Prince Edward Island uh, County in Virginia. I'm sorry, Prince Edward County, Virginia, um, because when Board, Brown versus Board of Education by the Supreme Court uh, happened in 54, um, the county shut down its school system rather than uh, desegregate its schools. Um, the question we're faced is, are descendants of enslaved Africans owed reparations? Um, they face slavery, the Homestead Acts, uh, a GI Bill that was uh, touted um, as a as a po point of pride to be uh, rewarding folks who had returned from war, but uh, very rarely were Black veterans able to uh, obtain support for it. Um, sharecropping, which left um, uh, Black families unable to uh, establish wealth, uh, buy land, etc. Um, Jim Crow laws, voting rights infringed, which is still happening. Redlining, as we, we discussed, and uh, mass incarceration. If we look at the racial health divide, you'll see that um, the uh, the average wealth for uh, Black Americans has actually gone down. It's actually decreased um, between '83 and 2016, and uh, it's only risen very small amounts for. Uh, uh, Latino uh, families, whereas for, as you can see, for whites, it has grown. Um, and then uh, fa Black families are uh, more than twice as likely to have zero uh, accumulated wealth as whites um, are. So where does reparations start? Um, the U.S. Congress, uh, since '89, the idea of to study and develop reparation proposals um, was uh, introduced each year by John Conyers um, before he passed, and it has been taken over by one of his uh, um, colleagues in the House. It would be comprised of 13 people. The commission would be tasked with examining the history of slavery in the U.S. and the systemic racism that resulted including federal and state government's role in supporting it and would recommend appropriate remedies. Um, despite being introduced for uh, over 30 years now, um, it, has never, uh, it has never made it to uh, a full vote of the House. So that, that leaves us with uh, looking at faith-based reparations and why, why, why should faith-based reparations be a thing? Well, if you look at um, the Bible itself, the book of Isaiah, your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live on. We are literally being called 
to uh, look at this issue. We are literally being called to work to address these um, past injustices. And it's happening across the country. Um, many of us know, uh, have heard of the, uh, the church in Baltimore that was uh, owned, was uh, founded by a slaveholder. Um, just last year, I should say, uh, they created a half a million dollar fund for reparations in the black community. We actually uh, hosted um, <clears throat> the rector for this church in one of our um, YouTube uh, conversations about reparations back in April uh, 2021 that you can still go and view. In 1969, the National Black Economic Development Conference was held in Detroit and they adopted James Foreman Foreman's Black Manifesto demanding 500 million in reparations for the mistreatment of African Americans from white churches and synagogues. Uh, he said, we know that the churches and synagogues have a tremendous wealth, the manifesto stated, and its membership, white America, has profited and still exploits Black people. Um, in the more than 50 years since uh, this, been, uh, this manifesto was adopted, uh, still very little has been done. And this is how All Saints uh, is exploring uh, reparations. Uh, we're facilitating an educational ses session about reparations at the annual meeting. Deacon Annette will be speaking to uh, the congregation. Uh, we have created our collection of resources about reparations that um, are available now on the All Saints website. If you look under resources, you'll see faith-based reparations. Um, we're making available all the resources, all the lectures that have happened, um, also available on the website. And we are looking forward to this March, where we will be hosting a series of focus group conversations with groups at All Saints. We really want to hear from every single person. Um, it will allow us to discuss reparations and the role that All Saints might play in, uh, in that action. We invite you to be, be involved. We want you to be involved. We want to hear your voice. We want to learn with you and from you as we take uh, any steps that might come. And also, um, all of our sources are available on the website as well, um, mostly through PDF. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, uh, watch this. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to a member of the All Saints uh, Reparations Working Group, uh, myself, Dustin Petty, Deacon Annette, uh, and Andrew McIntosh. Please feel to reach out. Have a good day.